Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the second installment of the STEM Teaching Essentials Workshop for this year. Uh, my name is Corey Feta Hartley. I'm um, in the College of Natural Science and I plan these workshops with a team who I'll introduce. Stephen Thomas over here, also from the College of Natural Science. Dinah Breedis, um just went to get pizza, I think. Laura Bix is back here in the corner from, Ag oh, there's Dinah from the College of Engineering. Um, uh, Laura is from the College of Ag and Natural Resources, and Suzanne Lang also helps us from the College of Ag and Natural Resources. I don't see Georgina Montgomery, um, but she's um, in Lyman Briggs and is also part of the team that plans these. So if you ever have ideas for giving a workshop or a workshop you'd like to see, please let us know and um, uh, we will, we're, we're working on the spring semester right now. Um, you'll see me talking from this microphone, but it's not amplifying anything. When you ask a question, please wait to get the microphone because it's actually for the recording. So these are recorded, they get captioned, and then they get posted on our website for people to be able to use. So if you can just wait till I get over to you, um, that would be great. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, my friend and colleague, Kendra Cheravello. So Kendra is a uh, professor in fisheries and wildlife in Lyman Briggs College. She was the previous um, associate dean in the uh, Lyman Briggs College. She is the co-director, I want to make sure I say this right, of the Data Intensive Landscape Limnology Lab. Limnology is a word that I only came to understand when I met Kendra. I had never heard of it before. Um, but in addition to, to her um, disciplinary research, she has done a lot of work, especially as it relates to um, building effective teams in the classroom. So we're very happy to have her here today. And she always gives a great, she always gives a great workshop. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kendra. Thanks, Corey. Well, I will admit that when I first told my sister that I was going to get a PhD in limnology, there was a pause on the phone and she said, the study of limbs? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, no. Limnos is Greek for water. So if that helps, I, I, I study lakes. They don't all look like this, uh, but I study a, a variety of lakes. As Corey said, I'm also in the Lyman Briggs College where I have over the last decade plus studied student research teams in my classes. Um, and that started basically out of necessity. Uh, when I first started there in 06, we put students in teams in our labs and there was a lot of dysfunction. And it was a lot of heart ache on the students' parts, on my part, on my TA's parts, trying to figure out how to help students work in teams. And so I started reading the literature, mainly from education and organizational development. Um, a lot of the education-related literature was in engineering uh, education and trying to figure out how I could help my student teams work better together. My class that I teach the most is introductory organismal biology. So those are pictures from the lecture and lab of, of that course. Um, and at the time, those courses were about 120 students each lecture section, and we broke them down into labs of 20 to 24 students. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to share with you my experiences over a decade plus of working with these teams and studying them and, and trying to help uh, everyone be more effective which increased to increase student satisfaction and learning and also decrease, I should turn that off. So anyway, that's what I'm gonna be sharing with you today is my work with these uh, research, with the student research teams in Lyman Briggs College. So uh, for today, what I'm hoping is that by the end of the workshop, you'll be able to explain what makes a cooperative team cooperative. That's the key word that we're, we're talking about today. Explain how and why cooperative teams can really increase student uh, learning and success. Create cooperative teams that are diverse and can build on each other's skills and backgrounds. Implement these teams in a way that really maximizes satisfaction and success. And I will just say this is both from the student perspective and the instructor perspective. It's really hard to manage a class of 120 when you know, a third of the teams are really having a hard time, right? So, so we're really trying to maximize students and the instructor's success and, and satisfaction, and then assess those cooperative teams. 
So let's start out first by just making sure we're all on the same, same page about what is cooperative learning. I put this um, comic up there to talk, to focus first on what it's not. Um, you know, there's this sort of traditional model of how students work in the classroom with vision and change and with all of the reform that's happened in all of our gateway courses moving um, in the last five to ten years, right? We've very much gotten away from this idea that students need to work in isolation of one another. But knowing that and then having, figuring out really strong ways to implement that and assess that, those, sometimes there can be a gap between those two things. So again, making sure that we are all on the same page about what cooperative learning is not, it's not collaborative learning. And I think, and I just had this realization about the difference between these two words like three years ago. So I'd been doing all this for years and years, and then I was reading something and I was like, oh, this is where we get all hung up, is the idea that we think about cooperative learning and we accidentally just flip in our head, we're actually thinking about collaborative learning, and it's not, they're not the same, and it makes huge differences. So collaborative learning is unstructured. So the idea is that professors can put their students into these teams, and the teams themselves come up with, figure out, negotiate goals, the problems, develop procedures. They're not given any training on how to work in teams, and then what ends up happening is often they're in, they struggle, okay? Cooperative learning is working in small groups in a very structured way, okay? And so the idea is behind cooperative learning is that students work together to maximize both their own learning and each other's learning, right? And so we'll, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about this cooperative learning and what makes it different from collaborative, but I wanna put that out first, that when you think about working with someone collaboratively, it's not the same as working cooperatively, and we're really aiming toward cooperative learning. So again, it's just that students working together to maximize their own and each other's learning. So you think, ah, that's a little pie in the sky. Am I really gonna think that so-and-so next to me cares about my own learning? Well, right, we have to build it, it's structured. Now, what constitutes cooperative learning is quite a wide range of things, right? So I show this spectrum to talk about whether you can start all the way on the one end from very simple and short-term activities that are cooperative learning um, opportunities, all the way to more complex long-term ones. So for example, on the, on the left-hand side there, the more simple short-term are things like think, pair, share, which I'm sure all of you do in your classes, and we're gonna do a punch, bunch of those today here. Right, in the middle is more formal, where you have teams for one class to several weeks, all right? So this is what I typically was using in my labs in class, was I was wor working, having them work in teams either for about four to five weeks or for an entire semester. And then on the right-hand side, you might think about more long-term base groups. There are some programs where you come in freshman year, you're placed in a, in a base group, that goes for a whole two years. They work through an entire cohort, uh, classes together, and really rely on each other for, for their learning and their success. And so that's more along that right side of that spectrum. Okay, so too much talking from me. First thing we wanna do is situate ourselves. What we're thinking about here is teams and think about how we each feel about teamwork, right? So what I'd like you to do is introduce yourself to the person next to you and talk with them about how much you like working in teams. Just, and then describe a team that you've been part of that's either really highly effective or that you found was particularly challenging. Share that experience with your, with your neighbor. <laughs> My volume okay back here? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's start back with a quick show of hands. Now, if I was in my class and I was doing something like this with my students, I would now ask them to all stand up, come down to the front, 
and make a spectrum from hate being on teams to love being on teams, get them active, get them moving, and have them all line up and be able to see, wow, there's a full range of how people feel about working on teams. Not going to work with as many of you and those desks. So let's just see, show of hands, how many of you enjoy typically working on a team? Oh, wow, that's amazing. All right, how many of you typically don't enjoy working on a team? Yeah, so less. Now, that's the most people I've ever had at a workshop say they like working on teams. So the culture may be changing. We may, we may be seeing a change. OK, could I just have a couple volunteers to share out some of, the, some of what you were talking about in terms of a, a particularly challenging or particularly effective team that you've been on? Who would like to share? <laughs> One of the things that we discovered in our conversations were that the teams that we knew that we were adding value to something helped us to stay motivated. And those that were, you know, why are we doing this and nobody really understood what the purpose was, those were the ones that struggled. So those that we knew that we were contributing and being impactful were fun and, and uh, actually resulted in what we were going for. We all really want to feel needed and valued as part of a team, don't we? Yeah. Hi. So both Ali and I both have the experience of working in teams where we work with people who have knowledge that we don't fully understand, actually. And we communicate at a very high level. I work with a chemist who's an organic synthesis chemist and a Mars specialist. And Ali works with other people who do more practical things, and he does mostly mathematical things. But it's interesting how you know, we're working at this sort of high level where we're exchanging information back and forth, neither of which side is completely sure exactly what the mechanics are of each other, right? I mean, that seems to be the modern world and why these, these kinds of collaborations are productive. Yeah, and so teams that bring together people with very different disciplinary expertise, right? And that can be very uh, exciting and, and a very rewarding experience for, for people. There was one other person who had their hand up over on this side, Kristen? Uh, so we were talking about uh, one thing that can be um, challenging, well, challenging, rewarding, depending how it goes, is if the members of the team have kind of voluntarily come together to work towards a common goal that they've all really invested in versus members of a team who have been just put together and uh, are told to somehow reach that common goal. Yeah. Right, and that last example is more of the uh, collaborative format where they're just thrown together and said, come up with a goal, right? The first one, you might just automatically envision a sports team or a club, right, where the goal is to win a medal or to win a competition, right? So very different connotations that those bring up. Now, I wonder if you all put yourselves in your, the minds of your students you're teaching right now. And raise your hands if you think your students right now would be psyched if tomorrow you went into class and said, I'm going to put you into teams. OK, so, so not necessarily the same show of hands that we had in the beginning where I said, how many of you like to work in teams generally? And that is the case that it's often that our students, and sometimes you, this one, not, this group, not so much, really dislike being put in teams and having to work in teams. And so that right there sets the stage for anything you want to do. That is an impediment to learning, right? If the students right from get the first stage are frustrated because they have to work in a team A, they are with people they don't know B, if either it's not clear why, right? That is going to really mess with your learning objectives. Now, the reason for why students often don't like to be put in teams and ourselves, harken back to some of the things you were saying about being on a good team. The, the, so this um, figure I adapted from one of Carl Smith's books. And along the bottom, we have different types of research teams. And at the um, y-axis, what we're looking at is performance level. And so the idea is that if any individual worked by themselves, you have variation in how well they do, right? So if you look at those uh, five dots there on the left, right, there's, there's variation. Some people would do worse than others. Now what happens is, is when we put students in teams, 
we often end up with those teams being what we call either pseudo teams or imbalanced teams. And what that means is now the team is getting only one grade, but the result is, is that the grade is either lower or the same as what any one individual in the team would have gotten themselves. And so the reality is, is that those students are in that team are saying to themselves, you're giving me more work because you're making me coordinate with people, you're making me deal with other people's schedules, you're making me deal with other people's personalities, when in reality I could do the same thing better or the same, get the same grade if I worked on my own. And so this is what we're trying to get away from with student teams, is we don't want to end up with these sort of pseudo teams or imbalanced teams where one person's doing more work than others, where there's a lot of, of uh, tension on the team. So how do we get there? How do we get away from those types of teams? Well, we really have to focus on cooperative learning. And so cooperative learning is really based on what we know about how people learn. That we learn best when we're active, right? When I said I'd get you up and have you walk, be on a continuum. That we're actively engaged, we're moving our bodies, we're talking with other people. We're not just sitting and passively getting that information. That it's student-centered, that it's social, right? All of our students, they want to talk with each other, right? When they come into a classroom, if they know someone, they, they're gonna sit next to them, right? That's just sort of the, the norm. And so what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we're building, we're making, or help fostering that cooperative learning using these things. So here are some characteristics of um, students working in cooperative teams. So the students strive for everyone's success, they celebrate everyone's success, and they're motivated to help and assist others. Again, you might think, boy, that's really pie in the sky. Are, are students gonna be able, do they ever really get to that point? But they will if we work hard to really set the structure and the stage and help them understand why and how to do it. And three main categories of this cooperative learning benefits are greater efforts to achieve. They're gonna put in more effort if they're really doing this cooperative learning. There's gonna be more positive relationships among students and greater psychological health. And you think about all the stuff going around at our campus nationally, internationally, with mental health issues, we need this, right? So cooperative learning can actually help students. They make those connections with other students. They know that they're being relied on and that they can rely on the others in their team. And it can help them in that, in that part of their lives as well. Now I imagine that most of you in this room have already, would already agree with me that diverse cooperative teams are gonna enhance learning and benefit knowledge generation. But I will just point out these three pieces. There's lots of research that has shown these. I can give you a long litany of, of papers that you could read. But there's research that shows that the minority view um, versus that there's, as teams become more diverse, you're gonna have more expression of minority views and more divergent thinking. Those are both really good things. That's how we, we all say that we want our students to be able to think critically, right? They can't do that if they're not hearing minority views and they're not hearing about divergent viewpoints. Teams with diversity of experiences and backgrounds, they're better at problem solving. They've done all sorts of funky experiments where they give different teams uh, problems to solve depending on the the diversity of the teams and the time, how long it takes and what kinds of creative solutions they come up with. And that over and over again, they find that those diverse uh, teams do better. And they found that multicultural experiences positively affect creativity. So creativity, innovation, problem solving, those are all things we say we want in our students. So one of the things that we'll t we'll, I'll talk about when we're talking about teams is making sure we're paying attention to diversity on teams and we're, we're not just letting that happen accidentally, okay? Okay, so back to this figure. You obviously, you're wanting to know there's obviously more stuff to go up here. How is it that we get over to this end of the spectrum, over here to high performing or highest performing um, cooperative teams? Now, the thing that's interesting here, if you think about this way on the right, this doesn't happen with a team that is gonna to be together just for a semester. This is only gonna happen with more longer term commitment teams, but you might be in some of those research teams right now for your disciplinary scholarship, for example. Or if you're a part of a, a program that uses base groups for two years, they might be able to get over to this end. But the idea is 
when you're part of one of these really high performing teams, your performance level of the team, the grade they get, the learning that they achieve is going to be higher than anyone on that team could have gotten individually. Okay? Now, getting buy-in that that's actually true can be difficult. And so we actually, I'll show you in a little bit, an exercise that we do in our class to try to help students see that this can actually be true. Okay, so the theory behind cooperative teams is that these five things will happen. You'll have positive interdependence. So what that means is, right, the students know that they need each other to be able to succeed, that they can't do it themselves. There's both individual and group accountability. It's not going to work without both of those. And so we'll talk through those. What we call promotive interaction. So that's the idea that they are really helping the others. It's not just working in isolation. There's got to be good social skills. Now, I don't know about you, but I worry a bit about the students today and their social skills. And so the reality is, is that part of what we're doing is we're helping them develop those skills. We have to see that as part of our job. And then team functioning is the last one here. The reality here is that being able to work effectively as part of a team means we have to train them how to do that. We can't just say, you're going to be a team you should know how to do that because they don't know and they're not going to be successful without really being taught how. So we're going to talk through all of these and sort of I'll give you some ideas of ways that I promote these in, in my class. All right, so that's the theory. So how do we do this in practice? First thing is that, um, and I learned this the hard way because I, tr I tried to do all sorts of interventions. They didn't at first seemed to really take and I had a lot of students complaining why are we doing this stuff and I realized you know what I have to make it explicit that teamwork is a professional skill that it's a science practice skill it's something that they have to learn as part of their education in my intro bio course it has to be valued and it has to be done explicitly it can't just be an implicit like I know it's valuable they have to know it's valuable so what I did was I created a learning goal that's part of the syllabus that's about teamwork and team management so I say that all students have to demonstrate modeling behaviors of inclusion and ethics and that they have to use leadership skills to foster problem solving team communication conflict management consensus building and idea generation Okay, so it's actually in my syllabus that this is part of what they're working on for the semester. So some parts of these we do better than others. I, for example, I'm still trying to figure out ways to really weave the ethics piece into my class. Okay? But I'll show you how we, how we work on some of these pieces. Um, once I put this learning goal into my syllabus, it really helped students to understand why we were talking about teamwork and why we were practicing it. So that then I wasn't getting the pushback from them and them saying, why aren't we doing biology, right? It really helped. And so that's the first thing to do is to make sure that you're actually talking about teamwork as a professional skill that they need to develop. Okay, so talking with your neighbor or neighbors again, Let's think about how we create teams. If you allow your students to select their teammates, what are the teams going to look like, first of all? And then how do you think team self-selection affects student success and satisfaction? Those two are not always the same, right? So talk with your, your neighbors and see what you come up with. So who wants to share their thoughts on self-selected teams? I got some smirky looks when I, I posed the question. <laughs> Gonna, okay. well, one second. One sec, please. <laughs> <laughs> the, the teams I've noticed tend to be lower diversity because they tend to pick people they know or like and have already been hanging out in social groups of like people. So Jory said that what he has seen is that people tend to pick the people they know or like or are more like themselves so the teams are not very diverse. Any other thoughts on self-selected teams? So Katie and I were discussing it 
even with just a minimal amount of information, such as their year or major, trying to mix up teams based on that information besides what was discussed there seemed to have better learning outcomes and students seemed happier perceptively to us than when we just let them basically form teams which seem to be in our laboratory classrooms just where they end up sitting down on the first day of class. Right, right. So even just using very basic information seemed to help with learning outcomes. So when we go into a class or a, a meeting and we see someone we know, we try to sit next to them, right? So we can catch up and, and chat and right? set a time to meet for lunch, right? So students do the same thing. Then if they end up in teams with those people, they've chosen to be on a team with people who they know they get along with. But getting along doesn't mean that they're going to work well together, right? And if you tend to get along with somebody, what's the likelihood of them coming up with divergent ideas, right? So even though students would much rather choose their own teams, I'm going to put on record that I think it's a really better idea for us to do the work of putting them very deliberately into teams that we create. And just to pull on a heartstring, you could also think about it as, remember in like junior high when they pick teams and there's always one or two or three people at the end who don't know anybody and are picked last? By making your own teams, you'll avoid that situation. Because guess what? There are students in your classroom who won't know anybody or will be the only person who has some visible identity who will not be chosen and will feel that way and that will influence their learning for the entire semester and maybe beyond, right? So I just will say I think we can do better than that and luckily here at MSU we have a site license to some uh, a online service so that we can do that using an online platform that's relatively straightforward and easy and, and is evidence-based. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. However, first I just want to share with you my timeline for how I do this in my class. It's going to vary depending on your class, depending on your objectives. Um, and it does vary a bit semester by semester for me even. So what I do is in week two is when I actually make those teams. Week one for me is always people moving around, shifting lab sections, dropping classes, whatever. And so I wait and don't form those teams until week two, once I know the drop ad period, everything's sort of settled down. So it doesn't mean I don't do some of the training sometimes in week one. Sometimes I do that uh, for teamwork training. But I wait and I do that, the forming of permanent teams until week two. And then I build on whatever kind of teamwork training I might have started in week one in their teams in week two. I spend a, a, a whole session, a whole three-hour lab session, talking about the hows and whys of teamwork. Okay? Now, there's some years I split that up and do it an hour in the first week, an hour in the second week, an hour in the third week. Sometimes I do the whole thing in week two. Okay? So you could pick and choose too, depending on which parts you think are most important. I assess teamwork, and so this means team functioning, not like how they're doing on biology. Very, I do this formally and explicitly during twice a semester, both times after they've just turned in a big team assignment. So the rubber has hit the road, any conflict that's going to come up had probably just has. And so then I, I take a temperature, how are things going, and, and work with them on how to do better. And then, of course, there's just the continuously helping troubleshoot all along the way. That doesn't go away by thinking more carefully about how you create and assess and train your teams. It just diminishes a, a lot in terms of the amount of it. So I, I, at the beginning, maybe about a third of my teams were struggling. You know, 10 years later, I'd say, you know, 10% of my teams are struggling. You, you always still have some, right? But it really reduces the amount of that. Okay, so creating those diverse teams. There's this program called CatMe. Uh, how many people have used CatMe already? Okay, so about a third of you. Um, so MSU has a site license. It used to be free. It was developed out of Purdue as a research, it was a, a research project, an education research project. It used to be free. Um, I was an early adopter and lots of people at MSU started using it 
And eventually what happened was they lost, they couldn't sustain their funding support for the research. So they had to make it something that you pay for the service. But luckily so many of us at MSU had been using it for so long that MSU said, well, yeah, obviously we need to get a site license. So the site license is there. It's still free for your use and your students to use. So there's two modules in CatMe. The first one is making teams, it's called Team Maker. And it's a, a module that you can use to create diverse teams that's very um, user friendly, uh, user centric. You get to choose how you want to create teams. You get to choose which questions you're gonna have on a survey that's sent out to the students. So these are survey questions that I often choose, but you could choose totally different ones. They have a whole bank of questions and you can choose whichever questions you want to use. So you said year and major was helpful, right? You could just ask year and major, and that would be all that would be on there. You get to choose the questions. So these are the types of questions that I often choose um, when I'm trying to make my student teams. And then I make those teams. So then what happens is the students get an email, they go, they fill out the survey, all the results come back to you. And as the instructor, it still is, you still have control in those teams. You get to say you, how much you want to weight either, each of those questions. So you can put more weight on some of them and others. You, have, you push a button, it creates teams, you look at them, you see if they look okay, based, and then you could change some of the weights and do it again. Okay? So it's still something you have a lot of control over. Then when I'm forming teams, what I'm trying to do is use sort of evidence-based practices to make sure that my teams are as good as they possibly can be. So up here with what is your gender, your race ethnic group, I'm looking to try to make heterogeneous teams, okay? Trying to get those to be diverse. Now, the literature says though that you shouldn't have a team with say one African American student, right? Because they may not feel comfortable. So I do try to pair those people up. Not always easy to do. So you're balancing lots of things when you're making these teams. This next one is about schedule. So in my experience, the Student scheduling a time to meet outside of class is like the biggest heartache and headache for them. And so I try to make sure that is homogeneous. I wanna make sure students have at least two times during a week where they have a two hour block that they can get together outside of class to work on stuff. Then down here, rate your writing skills. That I want to be heterogeneous. Again, we have a lot of writing we do in our lab. I wanna make sure some people can be helping others, right? So bringing value to a group. If someone thinks they're a really good writer, they will then feel like they're valued in that group. In this question, it asks how many hours outside of class do you intend to work on the class? And I want to make those, the groups for that question to be homogeneous. This will help get rid of the imbalance team issue where you have one person doing the majority of the work and then perhaps one person who's sort of a freeloader, okay? If you know their intention going in, you can help to, to deal with that. And then finally, I sometimes choose a question that's about sort of big picture versus detail oriented thinking and try to make those heterogeneous. So here are just some examples of the responses. Here's the questions, the, the answer you get back about the schedule, just a bunch of numbers. Here I pointed out, so this was that how motivated, how much time outside of class you're gonna spend on the class. Students are incredibly honest, right? So. 14% uh, of them are only going to spend two to four hours a week on the class, outside of the class, four credit class, intro bio, right? Now, some of those students are brilliant, and that's all they have to spend. But probably three quarters of them are just, they recognize they're self-aware, and they know that they have two jobs, they have four other classes, whatever, and that's all they've got. And so this question is that one that really can help in terms of making sure you don't have so right, whatever it takes is purple. So I teach in Briggs, there's a lot of really highly motivated students there. But you don't want a team of three students who said they'd do whatever it takes and then a student who said two hours a week, right? That's just gonna set things up for failure. So here's an example of what a resulting team might look like. So I've got two women and two men, they are all white. They have seven days a week with two hours plus what they can meet. They do not have very busy schedules, these people. <laughs> Their writing skills, we've got three goods and one basic. We've got five to seven or eight to 10 hours a week that they think that they're gonna spend on the class and very heterogeneous in terms of their sort of big picture versus detail oriented, okay? So that's just one example. And again, you can play with these depending on the weights that you say you wanna use. 
So this team maker, just doing this, really helped my experience. I had been using note cards and having them answer survey questions on note cards, and then I'd go home with my king bed and lay out the note cards, and whew, it was painful, right? This is a big, a big plus. So then the next step is you've got students in these diverse, I say diverse because Briggs is not, you know, we have 60% women and, you know, it's not super diverse, but as diverse as you can make them, teams, now what are you going to do, right? Remember, we're not trying for collaborative teams where it's unstructured. We're going to train them, help them understand why teams are important and how to be part of them. And remember we said that learning is a social thing. So the very first thing we do when we put them in these teams is a social activity. We give them Venn diagrams and we say, get to know each other. Things come out there where they talk about how many siblings they might have, or whether they have a pet, or the place that they grew up, right? Yeah, question? Before you move on, yeah. can you say a little bit about the literature of how big teams should be? Oh, yes. Two yeah, do you want her to repeat that into the... Okay, so she asked, could I talk a little bit about how big a team should be? Well, so it really depends on the goals, the learning goals that you have for the teams. And then, of course, there's logistics that go into it, how, how many teams you can manage. In my experience, teams of three or four work best. Four is ideal. In the literature, they say anything like over six to eight is going to be intractable. Um, in my experience, four is sort of a sweet spot. You, can't always, you don't always have divisible by four. When I have to make a choice between a team of three or a team of five, though, I do go with a team of three. I feel like that facilitates the positive interdependence more, whereas a team of five, it's easier for one person to sort of withdraw and not be as engaged. Now, if you have to use groups of six or eight, right, it's even more important to add additional structure in terms of assigning them particular jobs that rotate, right? And so that everybody really knows they have to be involved and in making sure that they are, they do maintain that sort of same level of engagement. So, that help? Are pairs always a bad idea? Well, pairs are not a bad idea. It's just, it's not a team. So the reality is, is that when you're working in pairs, you're much more likely to divide and conquer and then pull things together. Whereas when you're as part of a team, it's a little, it just sets you up to have to actually work together a little bit more. Um, and it, and it, so a pair, it's not like it's a bad learning situation. You may have real reasons for putting them in pairs and having them work in pairs. It's just that it's not technically a team. A team is bigger than two. <laughs> I mean, yeah, cutting those hairs. All the way on the left is a big pair share, but you know. Yeah. So anyway, the Venn diagram just helps to get like, so they had week one a lab, week two they come in and all of a sudden they've been put in these other, these teams. Now I will just say, CatMe, team maker, sends them an email. Once you make those teams, they'll send them an email saying, this is your team. So they know when they come into lab who they're supposed to sit with, or at least the names of the people they're supposed to sit with, right? So they sit down at a table and they're like, do, 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 right? So this is the first thing we do. And again, it's just trying to get to help them to see their, Differences and their similarities. Of course, there's more similarities than there are differences in most cases. Then we move on to an exercise called the moon. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question mm -hmm. about the van? Yeah. So, what is your, you tell them you're going to do a van and then you just tell them to do your differences and similarities? I need some guidance. Yeah. So she asked, how do you set up the stage for this Venn diagram? So, we actually have a whole presentation for the whole three-hour module. Again, some people break it up, hour here, hour there, whatever. And that Venn diagram is within, the mod within that presentation. It's not the very first slide. So we do set the context. We have, you know, they figure out our, on ours, right, we have a map of the lab and we, and we have people, wh which team is where and that kind of thing. Um, we don't talk about how or why teams before the Venn, we really are doing it in terms of we want you to get to know each other. So you're in this team, you're going to be in this team all, all semester. So let's talk about 
um, let's learn about each other. Now, I will say in my class, I often have used Venn diagrams in the lecture before this to do something with biology, look at ways of classifying and that kind of thing. And so this isn't the first time they've seen a Venn diagram. But we don't do a lot of setting the stage for this particular thing. It's more just like, OK, you're at a table with people you don't know. Let's get to know them. Yeah. But that whole module I have available, so you're welcome to look at it too. And so if anybody wants that uh, information, I have a thing at the, the end with my email. And, and you can reach out and get that. So then, remember I showed you that graph where I said high performing cooperative teams outperform pseudo and imbalanced teams. And I said, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard for students to really buy that. Well, this next exercise is to help them understand that that's possible. So have anybody in the room, have any of you done the moon landing exercise? Obviously, Cassie, you have. All right, so this is a really fun, again, this is also a way to get to know each other on the team, but it's a really fun exercise where you read through a scenario, you've been stranded on the dark side of the moon, you've got to get to the light side of the moon, you have this whole list of supplies that, you, that are with you, but you can't take them all, and so you have to prioritize the list of supplies and figure out and, and, and come up with what you're gonna take with you to get to the other side of the moon. And so there's this long list. I just put a, a few of them there at the top. And so what you do is each student individually goes through and ranks the items on the list. Then as a team, they sit there and they talk about the rankings and they come up with a team ranking. Okay? And then you get the NASA expert ranking and you see which, who did best, any individual on the team or the team working together. And only a couple times, in my experience, has anyone individually done better than when they're working together as a team? Because the reality is, is that people think of different things, right? Like somebody will say, oh, there's not enough oxygen for this, or oh, I wasn't even thinking about the gravity being different, right? And so they come up with different things when they're working together as a team. And so not only does just the ranking in itself really help them to see, okay, so these people I'm sitting with, they got something to bring to the table. Maybe I should work with them. But then also, there's a whole series of questions that they have to work together as a team that's about team processing, that helps them to understand, well, how did we figure that out? How did we decide on the ranking and not just be like, yeah, we'll just go with him because we know he got a, a 4.0 on intro chem, right? Because that can happen too. And so this exercise, not only do they see that teamwork can be good, but they also work through, like, how do we actually do this? What's the process? What might be, maybe there was a trip up that we realized after the fact we should have listened to so-and-so. And so then they can reflect on that and they can play into how they're going to work together when they're doing biology as a team. I spend quite a bit of time explaining why they should want to build their skills in cooperative teamwork. So these are just silly examples from pop culture, some of it dated, but, you know. I am in my 40s. Um, but the idea is, is that we know, right, that teamwork is important. We know that Harry couldn't have done it all, all himself. And the reality is, is that it works in the classroom too. And so the idea is trying to link, right, with students, trying to make that connection for students that, okay, there's a reason that we're, we're working in teams. I also, give, of course, give them science examples. So this is just from 2007, but I talk about the fact that science isn't done independently, right? The, it's a myth that there's lone geniuses working alone in a lab, right? And I, and I use Science and Nature because those are the preeminent journals, and I show them that almost all of them have multiple authors, right? So if you're going to be a scientist and publish articles in the awesomest journals, then you're going to have to work together in teams. And then I give them this ridiculous example, <laughs> right? That is eight million authors who, many of these probably didn't actually work together as a team, but it's just a funny example. And then because it's Lyman Briggs, I always emphasize because many of the students in intro bio think that they want to go to some sort of health related professional school after finishing, I talk about the way that health professionals work. They're not individual doctors working alone in their office and with patients, right? That's a myth as well. 
And so we talk about that. So again, just making that connection with students about why, it, why does teamwork matter? And so whatever class you're teaching, you could use same, some, some of the same, but some very different examples to help them to understand why teamwork is a professional skill they should care about. So then we talk, we work on how. How are we going to do this work? How are we going to work together as a team? When you guys had your think pair share and you said, you know, talk about an example of when you were part of a really effective team, some of you talked about characteristics of those effective teams, right? And so what we do is we have an exercise where the students have to come up with what those characteristics are. Now, unfortunately, they often struggle with coming up with the characteristics of effective teams. So what we do is we start by asking them to come up with characteristics of dysfunctional teams or ineffective teams, if that's the case. If they can't come up with those, then we ask them to do, okay, what are the, what are the bad traits that you know? And then from there, we can work to the good ones, okay? And so these are, this is just a, a screenshot of, of, that assi of that assignment. And we do this in the lab. Now, parts of this module you could actually have them do as homework ahead of time and then share you know you could do it in lots of different ways but we what i've done is i try to do as much of this teamwork how and why in class where it's a captive audience and they really have to engage with it i find that that helps with the the participation and the learning yeah about um i was I'm um, wondering about the, the program that you're using for putting the students into teams. And I get that if you put people together who have distinct strengths, that you're going to make a stronger team. And that's great, you know, if you're in a company and you want your strongest team. But, like, these are students, so partly it seems like we want them to further develop some of the skills that they might be weaker at. And so I'm just wondering how you balance that all. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you get to pick the questions that are on the survey. And so if there are particular things that you want them to develop while they're part of a team, you could ask a question that asks them about their perception of those skills, right? So the, the writing, writing their, their ability to write was my example there. But if you're, it's a very math-based course, you could ask a question about that. You could ask there's computing questions, right? So you could form your groups in a way that if you want peer learning to happen, you have it heterogeneous. But if you want them to really struggle and work through the struggle, maybe you want that to be homogeneous, right? The answers to that question. Maybe helping them identify what they think are the things that they need. Yeah, so it sort of depends on what questions you put on that first survey. Yeah. One of the other things that we spend a lot of time on as part of the training them how to be part of these cooperative teams is talking about um, team development. So there's actually theory out there from years and years ago about how teams form and develop. Um, and it's called the sequential stage theory of team development. And so they have these five stages that they you know, made rhyme, form, storm, norm, perform, and adjourn. That one doesn't rhyme quite as well, but they, you know, they tried. Um, it actually was because the first four, the first time they published it, it only had four, and then they realized they kind of needed that last one, and yeah. Um, so I bolded storm here, and that's because I want to work with the students to understand that conflict is not a dirty word, that conflict is actually something that's necessary for teams to do the best work that they can do. And so what we do is we talk about what is conflict and what are the ways that we all as humans tend to deal with conflict. And we go through an exercise about that. And then we talk about, well, how is that going to play out in my team? And so what we do, I have one more funny little comic there. Um, is we actually do a conflict management instrument. Um, there's lots of them out there that you can choose from. The one that I pulled was from Carl Smith's Teamwork for Ed Engineering Classes book, but I've actually used a couple other scales as well in other contexts. And what the students do is they go through and they read a, a long list of, 
of um, sentences, and then they have to rate how they would list, how they would um, respond to those, and then they put their answers into this scoring box, and they figure out that there's five, so there's five main ways that people deal with conflict, and based on their responses to all those questions, they figure out what's their dominant way of dealing with conflict, okay? Now, most people have one or two of these that they just fall back on subconsciously without realizing it. Some people, it's more even, but it's pretty rare. In science, as it turns out, uh, confrontation is actually quite common. Maybe that won't be a surprise to any of you, um, but that's, that's pretty common that people want to confront a problem, work through it, and, and find solutions, okay? But, right, you've all been in a team where somebody withdraws in conflict, right? And knowing, like as a team, so individually you do this exercise, you figure out how you tend to deal with it. Then as a team, you sit down, you talk about how each of you tends to deal with conflict. Now in your team, you know if you have someone on the team who's gonna withdraw. You know if you have someone who's just gonna smooth things over but not really deal with the problem, right? And you know if you have two out of the four who are confronters and might be, right? So the idea is, is that they actually talk through what's that gonna look like when we run into conflict. And we actually have them come up with a list of what are some likely conflicts you're gonna experience in this class? Things like so-and-so isn't answering any of the text messages we send them about the assignment that's due next week, right? Or so-and-so has a really important life event that happens and they have to be gone for a week, right? Those are conflicts. And so we actually have them talk about these scenarios and what it might mean and how it might play out in those groups. The other thing I show them is that even though we have one or two of these conflict modes that we're most comfortable using, that we fall back on, we can use all five. We're capable as humans of doing that. And which, which mode we use really should depend on both how important the relationship is that you're the person you're in the conflict with and the goal of what you're trying to accomplish. And so when we're talking about student teams that are gonna come up with a, a, a research project, implement it and present a poster on it, that's a pretty important goal, right? And so in the class, they should be up in that upper part of that graph. And so then you think about the relationship. Now, if these teams that you've put students in are only gonna be around for two weeks, well, then the relationship might not be that important. So at this end, they might only be, maybe it's best to just withdraw, compromise, or force. But if it's a relationship where you have to be in a team with a student for an entire 15 weeks, yeah, you kinda gotta figure out that relationship. And so what we say is that, you know, probably what you're gonna all wanna practice, regardless of where you fall on which of these you're most comfortable using, you're all really gonna wanna practice compromise and confrontation. And then every once in a while, depending on the assignment, eh, force or withdraw maybe, right? But the idea is, is that you talking through how this works, just giving students the awareness and the language to use can really help set that stage so that they're ready for when conflict arises. And so, we, as I said, we actually have them come up with conflicts and, and work through how are they going to resolve those conflicts. I can't help myself with these cartoons. There's just so many out there that are like perfect. Um, and so as part of this process, the last piece of this conflict part is that the teams have to sign, have to make and sign a team contract. And so many of you may have used a team contract before in your class, it's probably very similar. We have, we have some stock like, as a team member, I'm gonna come to class, I'm gonna prepare, I'm gonna participate, like that's all built in. But then they actually are supposed to come up with particular rules that they've decided on that they want to follow, some norms of behavior for their team. Everyone has to sign it. Um, and about halfway through the process of working, of, of dealing with teams, I added this quit or fire clause and what this says is that if all of the students in a team except one agree that somebody should be fired, then that can happen. Or if one of a team member says they want to quit, that can happen. Now, in my experience, I've only ever had two people 
ever experienced this, and both of the times they quit because they were sick of working in their teams and they wanted to do it, their work in, individually. In both of those cases, the grade they ended up with and the learning experience they had was not as good as what the team came up with. And they recognized it in both cases. They came to me afterwards and was like, I should have stayed with the team, right? But the idea is by inserting this in there, we, it almost never comes to this. We have all sorts of dysfunction that we troubleshoot along the way. It almost never comes to this, but it gives students peace of mind. They see that and they go, okay, if there is a really bad uh, a person in this group who's just a freeloader, who's driving me crazy, I know there's a way to get rid of that person. It just gives them a little like safety net in their head. It's not like we actually use it, but it's there, it makes them feel better. So that's why we, we added that in there. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the fact that, so we need positive interdependence. What that means is, is that people need to bring different skills and backgrounds and be valued for those, but it also means that their team, the team assignments have to be difficult. If you're putting students in teams just be, only, solely because you only have enough sets of equipment for your lab or for your class for people to work in teams, they see that and it's not really teamwork, right? It's a sharing of resources, okay? And so the idea is to be thinking about teamwork as a professional skill that you're trying to help develop. It's a learning goal and so you're very careful about how you design every one of those assignments because you're really trying to get rid of anything down here, right? So one of the ways you do that too, or you also help with that is that you make sure, right, we talked about both individual and group accountability. Those are super important. And so we're gonna talk through some examples of these, of both these, the four and five now. So here are just a few examples. For individual accountability, so my students work in teams for the whole semester, they design a research project, they implement it, they do the stats, they write it up, they have a poster, right, it's all team. What we do is we use Google, for all of their drafts of all of their, their posters, their proposals, whatever, and we check revision history. So we actually look who is contributing to this work. And is it student A did the first section, student B did the second section, student C did the third section? That's not teamwork, right? And so we do, and we do this on a week to week basis, so it's not like a surprise at the end, right? But we actually talk through how to make writing come from one voice, how to make decisions together as a team, and we talk about using the Google revision history to really check on that. We also have each student has to have their own individual lab notebook, and we check those notebooks to make sure they're actually sharing the load in terms of data collection, in terms of data analysis, right? Like we're looking to see, to make sure everybody on the team knows how to do their t-test. It wasn't just one person who had the math skills, the stats background, who did all the analytical work, right? And then we actually have individuals have to demonstrate their ability to do the methods. Right? So if there's something that requires pipetting, they all have to pass a pipetting test, right? Like, it's not that only the team project at the end gets a grade. It's that there's all the things that went into the team project that they're graded on individually, okay? Question, is your lab yeah. notebook or <laughs> It's been changing through time. Um, it sort of depends at this point with that. Some, I still ask that they all buy a physical notebook and write in it. However, there are plenty of things that they do where they need to be able to make sure their teammates can access like their data collection log. That piece of it I will allow to be um, online so that different people can view and, and contribute to it. But I do require a, their notebook to be individual because otherwise, you know, it just, that is the reality is that we all are working on our computers, but in a student setting, it's hard to make sure that that's still independent if it's on the, on the computer, even with the Google revision history. Um, and then for the mixture of team and individual grades, right? So we have this poster, we have the, uh, and that's the, the team project, right? It might be worth 30 points. But then there's an individual peer review. That's a pretty rigorous um, exercise. That's worth five points, it's done individually. And then they each have to individually present their poster to me, right? And so that is graded 
separately. I ask questions about each section of the poster to make sure that they really know what they did and that they were really involved, and that's individual. And so this is just an example of how you can design to make sure that you have both the individual and the team accountability in there. Janice? So, Kendra, when you do that with the class, um, you've got... I'll repeat. <laughs> you've got the poster, and mm -hmm. then you hear from each of those three or four group members, so that's a lot of time. It is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How, how do you... I guess, how do you balance that as an, as an instructor, right? Because that's, teamwork sometimes can reduce the, the grading load, but here it sounds like you still have so much as an individual that mm -hmm. that's not really something coming out of this. Yeah, so Janice asked, like, okay, so if you meet with each student individually, that's a lot of time. And how do you balance, like, if you have a big class, that seems like it'll take too much time as an instructor to do all that. Um, we do have TAs and undergraduate learning assistants who we can train to do this with us and to help. Um, and so that can take some of the load. Sometimes we've done a thing where we sort of random draw, we ask each student only about one section of the poster and they don't know coming in which section they're gonna be asked about and so that will cut the time. Um, it's, there's no like silver bullet for that. I mean, the reality is is that if you want to make sure that there's individual accountability, it, it is gonna require more than if you just graded everything as a team project. Yeah, yeah. I thought there was some university regulation where you can't have students grade each other and have that be part of the grade. Yeah, so undergraduate learning assistants, if you're having them grade, they have to grade stuff that's very objective. So what that means is you have to build super detailed rubrics. And so for those presentations, it has to be very explicit, like what would get them full credit, what would get them a point off, that kind of thing. It has to be able to be objective. Yeah. Okay, so think of a scenario when students worked in a, semester, in a project, uh, in a team, all semester, they're given the same team grade at the end. How do you think they feel about that? And what additional ways would you assess students? I just gave you some examples from my class that work for me. But now think about when you are working in your class with your teams, what are some ways that you think, you know, all right, they're working in teams, but I could ask, I could, you know, once a, every three weeks have a mini quiz about this or whatever. So come up with some ideas with the people that you've been talking with about how you could add individually, individual accountability for your student teams. All right. So who would like to share some ideas for how you might include individual accountability in your classes for team work? We also had the um, team members evaluate each other. I think Katmi has a peer evaluation uh, uh, event there yeah. too, but uh, before Katmi, we just did it on paper, yeah. and it was quite clear when teams were pretty honest about this person contributed nothing yeah. so or, or less. And so that that knowing, I think knowing that that was going to happen, staved off some of that, but there were cases where we actually reduced um, the grade on, on one of the reports based on feedback. Mm -hmm. And so that's a case where, you know, you have to be careful because, again, students can't grade each other, but usually there's other evidence to support that. You've seen, it's not like no one's in the classroom watching, right? And you've seen that there's one person who's not there half the time or doesn't bring in their stuff or, yeah. Well, one of the things that, that I do is that I, I get them to write a reflection. So I, I sometimes I play a little game with groups, and then I tell them to write a reflection of how they could have done better or why did they do, didn't do very well. So something like that. So that becomes an individual grade in addition to the group grade. Yeah, I love any way that you can Im introduce games and self-reflection. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Um, so in one of our classes, it's the same class in Trovio, um, we have our students do exam corrections because the individual exams are really difficult. 
but the exam corrections were actually testing the effects of working in a group on those corrections. And so it's interesting, we've done individual and group corrections. Individual, sometimes they still turn in the wrong answer. But group, it almost rarely happens. So they learn from each other's mistakes. So another way of adding in working in your teams that will help them individually. Yeah. So uh, one thing I found effective that my students actually like, because I instituted halfway through a semester and I heard a lot of positive things about it, was for when they had to do their research reports, which were journal style articles, or for formal PowerPoint presentations, they had to put their initials of who did most of the work on that slide or that figure or that section of the paper, and they all had to write a little thing. We agree that these people contributed the most to this section, and that seemed to work really well. Yeah, just being confronted with the statement, we all created this together. So on all of our team exercises at the bottom, it says we agree that we all contributed equally to this this effort. Just adding those sorts of things can really change them how in their mind their mindset about it. And I love your idea of adding initials to whoever did the most on whatever slide, right? Um, that's sort of like looking at the Google revision history to see who who did what writing. Okay, so let's talk about assessing and troubleshooting team process. So this is where we come back to CatMe and individual and team reflections. So the other module, I said that CatMe has two modules. One is to make teams, the other is to assess team functioning. And so what I do is after they turn in a big assignment is that then they receive another email saying there's a survey that you need to go and, and complete. And again, you have a lot of control over the questions that are going to be asked. You get to choose. Um, so for example, the types of things that I am asking them about is contributing to work, interacting with teammates, keeping the team on track, expecting quality, and having knowledge skills. Those are the general categories that I tend to use. And so this is an example of what the students get is they're on this website and it says these, it's asking them, this is description of the quality of work is the one that this is showing. And these are each uh, column here is a different student on the team. So they rate themselves and they rate each of the other people on their team on each of the qualities. And then what they get back and what the instructor sees is the results of that. So it shows you how you rated yourself. This one, um, the person didn't do it. Th and then how your teammates rated you, and then your average rating. And so what happens is for each student, they get an email after the survey is closed saying, here are your results. You go in and read it, and you can learn from that experience. The instructor gets a whole report. You can go in and look at what, what the, the students' teams are experiencing. And one thing that I really like is part of that report that the students get is they get concrete ways that they could do better on their team. So research suggests that you could do these things and you'll improve your ratings, okay? Now here's an example of some of the output that you as instructor get and what it can look like. So right, for each student, you know what team they're on and then it's their, all their scores for all these different measures that you, that you um, asked the survey questions about. And then you get flags. So you have flags that, um, for example, CatMe will flag if a person rates themselves higher consistently than their teammates. They'll do the opposite if a person tends to rate themselves low compared to their teammates. They'll give you a flag if it appears that there's a click in a team. So lots of different flags that are really helpful as a, a professor. And then, of course, there's open-ended comments areas where Sometimes you get things like this, I love my team. Sometimes this is where I find out something really bad is happening on a team and I need to intervene, which I'm not sure that they would do, they would come to me in person about. And so I have found that part to be very helpful. And then here's the report back that a student got. And I like, I show you this one because this is one example of one of the flags. The student gets back this report and the, it says, your self ratings were significantly lower than your teammates' ratings of your contributions to the team. The members of your team have indicated that you're highly effective. Please try not to minimize the value of your contributions, right? So you see, I actually can see, like the day the reports come out, the next time in lab, when somebody has gotten one of those reports, their whole like being is different, right? Like you can imagine that person who thinks that their work is crap, and then they get this thing and they're like, oh, Right? So I really like this part of the, of, the, uh, of the program. 
Now, unfortunately, some students don't read the report. So the email goes out and they say, you know, click on reader. And sometimes students just they think, well, I got my point for doing the survey and they don't open it up. So what I did was I developed over time, I realized this was a problem, so I developed a reflective homework assignment where they have to open the report and answer questions based on it. And so again, introducing that individual reflection about their work in a team. And then they bring that in to lab, and as a team, they sit down and talk about, okay, so how, how as a team are we gonna do better over the next six weeks of the class? Like what are the concrete th steps we're gonna put in place to help us to do better? Um, and so this, this assignment has really changed the way that students engage with team functioning. The, the CATME report, if they did really reflect on it, uh, it would be great. They didn't, so I added this assignment and it really has, has made a difference. Okay, so we've gone through how in practice I've been promoting cooperative teams in my class. Now let's just end with, well, so what's the outcome? I've told you a little bit, but let's go through each one. So first I said you really have to, um, my experience has been that I really had to explicitly value effective te teamwork. And I found that by adding that learning goal and talking about it, it really increased student buy-in. I use TeamMaker to create, deliberately create diverse teams, much easier. It's based on you know, the literature. It's, it's worked really well for me. I think I have found it's really important to train students how to be part of effective teams. They're not getting this training elsewhere. I have asked questions on a pre-survey about have you received teamwork training before? And a lot of students say yes. The follow-up question is, in what capacity, and almost all of them check either band or sports. You're not getting teamwork training as part of band or sports. I mean, maybe like 10% are captains, and maybe they had some sort of formal training. But they're not getting it elsewhere. Um, and the result of this is that we actually are promoting science practices, right? We're, we're helping students think and act like scientists. This is how we work in our teams. I have ended up with, I feel better research projects, fewer dysfunctional teams, which means the inter fewer instructor interventions, fewer student complaints, and more positive comments. So all good there. <laughs> this is just one example that I pulled from one of the CATME uh, reports. So I do this, the, a second CATME evaluation at the very end of the semester, because sometimes things don't fall apart in a team until toward the end, right? And it's also helpful, students, I find, like psychologically, it's just helpful for them to have a place to vent near the end of the semester. So sometimes that last um, CATME assessment, there'll be also a blah on the, on the open-ended comments, but sometimes it comes out something like this, which is great. Um, I make the team assignments difficult, right? So that's, that's a piece that you're gonna have to, you may struggle with a bit, because it may be that you've just been putting students in teams because it's less grading, because you don't have enough resources, for lots of different reasons that are valid, but it's not really teamwork then, right? And so thinking about how to make your, your assignments difficult is gonna be important, because they need to have that student positive interdependence, and that really um, improves your, your buy-in. And then making sure that there's lots of grading opportunities all along the way. You don't want one big team grade at the end and that they're individual and team based, right? So that has really resulted in many fewer complaints, much more positive comments. And it, and it is really good because if you do it ongoing throughout, it allows me to do little corrections, right? Realign, fix things along the way because I can see what they're not getting, right? So it really helps in the teaching arena too. And then finally, using CATME to assess and trouble, and the teams formally and then troubleshoot, troubleshoot those teams uh, uh, frequently is, is really helpful. And again, it's the CATME website, so they have one of their tabs is publications or research or something like that. It's all their questions and the way what their suggestions are, they're based on the literature and they provide you with lots of that literature for you to go and read if you want to learn more about how you should form your teams and how you should assess them. 
Um, and it really does feed back into your, your teaching and, and facilitate that realignment. Okay, so our last thing, which that clock is slow, so we're probably almost done. But what I'd like you to be thinking about as you walk across campus, going back to wherever you're going, is, is there anything in this last 90 minutes that you think you might actually want to do in your class? And if so, what's going to stop you from doing it? What are the challenges around it? But, but what are the advantages for student learning, for your own ability um, to teach in your class? So what are those challenges and advantages that you might foresee for being able to implement something that, you talk, that we talked about today? Okay, so think about that as you're walking to wherever you have to walk. Um, Okay, so hopefully we got through all these learning objectives. Please don't hesitate to email me if you have questions, if you want any of the resources. I actually have an article that's coming out in the American Biology Teacher. They say it's gonna be in the January issue that has the entire module as an online appendix. Um, I'm happy to share materials. I don't want anybody reinventing any wheels, right? The whole point of these sorts of workshops is that we can all learn from each other. So just reach out and holler if you want anything, okay? Thank you, everybody.